and, and, uh, and just different thoughts concerning hell because one of the arguments of those who don't believe in hell, and I don't know how you can read the Bible and not believe in hell. I mean, where else will we learn about hell except it came out of the Bible? Uh, but it's strange how, how that is. Some people study the Bible so hard that all of a sudden hell's not there anymore. And uh, so uh, I, I have that. I've had it twice in writing how men go through and take all those places and, and, and argue them right out of the scriptures. And I can't find <laughs> where I downloaded the last time I did that. Uh, I'd like to have it when we get to those New Testament verses. But, but the other part is, is that one of their arguments is, is as if they argue that there is no hell in the Old Testament. Then they argue that Paul never teaches about hell. And so when you're just reading about the Gospels and what Jesus Christ said about it, you're just misinterpreting what Jesus Christ is saying. Well, it's not true. Uh, Paul speaks about hell. The Old Testament speaks about hell. And one of the things is, is th- the way their line of reasoning is, is that, that as if there is no concept of eternal life in the Old Testament. Uh, because if there is the concept of eternal life throughout the Old Testament, then they knew about eternal things. They didn't just live in the physical present with no understanding of eternal things. They definitely understood eternal things. And the eternal things involve eternal good as well as eternal wrath of God. And, and so what we did is we just started looking at the scriptures. And even though we use some New Testament verses, it launches us back into the Old Testament because many times the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament. And uh, one of the first things that we saw is how the de- uh, that hell was created for the devil and his angels. And that man who is just a little lower than the angels, there is three parts to man. Man has a spirit, he has a soul, and he has a body. And if you're here and you don't know what the salvation, what salvation is, you don't know that your sins are forgiven, you don't know how to have eternal life, there's already one third of you that's dead. And that is, the Bible says that you're dead in trespasses and sins. And the deadness that we're talking about is spiritual death. It's certainly not physical death. You're sitting here and alert, so it can't be physical death. And the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So there's a warning that there is death that's going to come to the soul, but that death hasn't taken place yet. And you do know that if you live long enough physically, you're going to physically die. And so there's a physical death that you need to worry about. But more than that, you need to worry about your soul. When it dies, where is it going? Because it doesn't go to the grave. Uh, That part of you doesn't... uh, Death means separation, and physical death is your soul and spirit separate from your body. Uh, You can can buy a plot of land and know where your body is going to go, but you can't determine where your soul is going to go uh, unless you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and then you know God's going to save your soul, and then the Bible would tell you as a believer that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And then that would wait till resurrection. Uh, but as we said, that if you're here and don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't know what the gift of God is, haven't heard about the gospel of salvation, there's already part of you that's dead, and that is your, your spirit is dead. God told Adam that the day that he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he will surely die. We're talking about the Bible versions on Sunday, because the first time you run into Satan... He begins to question Eve, hath God said, and then when he's done questioning Eve, you know what he says? Ye shall not surely die. And you have to ask yourself a question. Right after Satan said that, Eve takes the fruit, she takes a bite, hands to her husband, he did eat, and the eyes of them both are open. Did they die or not? Well, five chapters later, Genesis chapter 5 says, Adam lived 930 years and he died. Well, what happened to the day that he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He's going to surely die. Satan says, you surely won't. Some people say he didn't. (laughs) He lived 930 more years. But no, there was a death that took place the day he ate of that, and his relationship with God was severed by sin, and that what death is is a separation, and he spiritually died. And spiritual death passed upon all men at that point, that when you're born of your mother... You're born with a soul and you're born with a body and you have a human spirit, but that spirit is no longer in tune with God. It is cut off from God. It is separated from God. And there's a spiritual death there that exists until a person comes to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And today we live in a day in which God regenerates the believer 
Because the moment you believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for your sins and trust only what he did for your salvation, God gives you eternal life and he don't wait to give it to you later. He gives it to you the moment you believe because what he does, as soon as you believe, you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. He puts his Holy Spirit in you and the Spirit of the living God unites itself with your spirit and you have spiritual life. And a life begins the moment you trust Christ as your Savior. That because of your father. Well, I hear what you're saying. I'm not going to. Re- you got to say it real loud for the tape to pick it up. But I don't talk for the sake of the tape. But I understand. I guess I should. That the sin is passed down through the father. I, I said that if you're born, since you were born of your mother, that you're born in sin, and uh, that is true because you have a father, and uh, that's where the sin is passed down through the man, because man is the one who originally sinned. Uh, go with me to Genesis chapter four. Now that that sparked because man has spirit, soul, and body, and hell was created for the devil and his angels. There is a part, uh, Matthew 25, what it's telling you about there is some people that are going to, human beings, are going to join the devil and his angels in that lake of fire in hell. So that hell does exist, and from the very beginning when man sinned against God, they they had a consequence, not only a spiritual death, but the loss of their soul that was going to spend go to the place where the devil and his angels are unless God would bring salvation. And God promised right from the beginning a seed of a woman and that is to someone who would be sinless so there's a good reason to make that point that Dave said uh, Jesus Christ being born uh, of Mary without any human uh, father uh, he was born without a sin nature he wasn't born spiritually dead uh, he experienced a spiritual death when he went to the cross and our sins were placed on him on the cross and he died there on that cross paying for our sins and suffered the consequence of our sins on that cross so that he could become our savior. Um, but the the other thing is is so that there is this place where the devil and his angels are going to go because they're not going to cease to exist. They're going to exist forever. And it, there's plenty of angels that have followed the rebellion of Satan and they're going to be put somewhere a prison that's called hell or the lake of fire. Uh, Man is going to join him there because man being lower than the angels and greater than animals, uh, man, there's a part of man that does exist forever. You go into the grave, man doesn't just die like a dog and is annihilated and doesn't exist anymore. There's a part of man that will always continue to exist and it's got to go somewhere. And if it's alienated from God, then it's going to go to a place apart from God's kingdom. And God's kingdom is going to be a new heaven, a new earth. And the only other place mentioned in in, Genesis, in Revelation 21 is that lake of fire. So man will join the devil and his angels in that. Then what we did after that is we went to Genesis chapter 4, and I don't want to linger the point except that I, I wasn't, we kind of worked our way through it. And, uh, and my point to you was simply to tell you that Cain, in the judgment that was made against him, knew something, I believe, that more than than maybe the average person sees when they read Genesis chapter 4. And I, I want to do a little bit more about proving that to you uh, as, as we look at this again and then move past it. Uh, we spent most of the time last time looking at this. But in, in Genesis 4, Cain and Abel, the first two sons to Adam and Eve, were born into the world, and you immediately start seeing that there is a nat- natural bent towards sin, Cain rebels against God and offers to God the fruit of the ground that, since he was a farmer, that he brought when God asked for a sacrifice. Abel brought a sacrifice, a blood offering to God for their sins, and and God had respect unto Abel and his sacrifice, but didn't have respect unto Cain or his sacrifice, and then gave Cain an opportunity just to do right. I like what he says there in verse 6, if you do right, will you not be accepted? Okay, Cain, you learned I didn't accept that. Now just go bring me the right thing, I'll accept it. Well, instead of Cain just doing what God requested, he gets jealous of his brother and the first murder takes place. Verse 8, Genesis 4, 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against uh, Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I... Uh, am I No, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? 
the voice of thy brother's blood crieth uh, unto me from the ground. And now thou art uh, uh, cursed from the earth, and hast o- uh, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the, from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I, I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now, as you keep reading on in this chapter, Cain goes out and in rebellion against God, if he's going to be a fugitive and a vagabond and the earth's not going to grow, he builds a city, names the city after his son, and uh, and and lives, well, we would say not happily ever after, but uh, he does continue to live. And, and the question as I go through this, some people just look at that, is that all that Cain's punishment is? Is that uh, he now cannot be a farmer anymore? The ground, it doesn't say it won't yield uh, fruit. It just says in verse 12, won't yield her strength. So you kill your brother, and so God's curse on you is you're only going to get a half a crop every year. And you're going to be a fugitive. You can't live in the city. You've got to go live off on your own. So he goes, starts his own city, and tries to overcome that. That's the penalty for death? What? Yeah, we're, we're going to deal with that. What's that? Yeah, but he seems to be trying to overcome that when he built a city, so he doesn't have to roam around anymore. And it looks like, you know, like like I always say, if you if you can't grow food, you better live in a city, because the farmer will grow food and bring it into the city and sell it to you, and then you can buy food. I mean, that's what cities are all about. The farmers live out in the in the uh, uh, rural areas and, and bring their crops in and, and you know you, you see him trying to overcome uh, the punishment that he has uh, uh, been afflicted on here well the punishment is is greater than than I think we're talking about because when Cain said himself the punishment in verse 13 is greater than I can bear uh, that don't sound too hard to bear does it Okay, yeah, you're catching on real good. That's where our study's going. <laughs> yeah, let, let me let me ask you. First of all, look up in verse ten. The God God comes to Abel and he uh, and a uh, Cain and questions him about where's Abel and he says my brother's keeper and then God says this and he said what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. What is the cry? What is Abel's blood crying to God to do? Absolutely, it's crying for vengeance. Where's justice? And, uh, and, and there is a cry. Just think of all the different murders that have taken place since this was the first murder. Just think of all the murders that have taken place since this time. And if the ground cries out to God for every person who's been murdered, just think of how loud that cry is and what's God doing about it. I mean, you don't have to turn on the news any particular day. Six o'clock, I go home, or five o'clock, I go home, I eat dinner, come back just after six, and uh, and turn on the news while I'm at home, and hear this guy, they're searching for this guy who took this four-year-old girl, and she threw up on him, so he threw her up against the wall and killed her. And now they're hunting him down. They might catch him, they may never catch him. To, to see the other guy... They just caught a guy in, 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 this is all today at six o'clock. They caught a guy over here in, in, uh, in Clinton Township who is part of the, the Nazi, uh, concentration camp. He ran one of the, he was one of the guards or one of the people at the, the concentration camp. They've been looking for him for years, 70 something years old, and they, they found him over there, uh, responsible for over 200,000 tortures and murder. Now, that, that's a lot of people crying out to God, and the thing that must be crying to the ears of God is for justice, vengeance. And, you know, it's the Apostle Paul that's going to tell us in Romans chapter 12 that you don't have to worry about vengeance because God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Because the other question I have down in verse 15, 
the Lord said unto him, Whosoever there slayeth king. Cain's worried about it. Everyone's going to hunt me down and kill me. Everyone's going to get vengeance. So God says, uh, Whosoever uh, slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him a sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Was that mark a mark of protection? Yeah, see, Cain's saying, look, uh, I can't take this punishment wherever I go. Someone's going to be slay, want to slay me. So God put a mark on him. And the warning of that mark is anyone touches Cain, I'm going to punish him seven times worse. So is God protecting the murderer? How, how's that justice? He's preserving him for that punishment. Yeah. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. I look at this passage and I don't see that there's no warning of judgment of, of facing God in the future for eternal wrath. I see that the only thing that Cain's facing is that eternal wrath. God's going to take care of them. No man's going to take the vengeance on him. Eventually, when they get off the flood, uh, off the ark, when the flood's over, for the first time, God is going to allow man to execute capital punishment for the crime of murder. In fact, he's going to command it. And that's where you get the in the law of Israel, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Did all of a sudden God figure out what justice was? Or has God always been a holy and just God? And there's always been an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And as the world begins to multiply and cruelness takes over the earth, that God informs man, don't wait just for the eternal wrath, start executing it now. And uh, certainly that, that mark on him is because God's going to take care of him and justice is going to be done. Uh, when he says the punishment is greater than I can bear. Now look at the verse that others have saw that there's something that Cain understood here. Verse 13, it says, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And now he's going to explain what he's talking about. This is Cain's words. Here's, here's what he's worried about. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And then he talks about being a fugitive and a vagabond where? In the earth. When he says, Thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, well, he didn't leave the earth, did he? It must be from civilization that's on the earth, from his brothers and sisters uh, that are being uh, born unto uh, uh, Adam and Eve. And, and as the early civilization is there, he's not going to be a part of that civilization. He's going to be separated off, and he's going to, he's going to take a wife and go off on his own and start his own civilization over there and, and start the way of Cain. So the face of the earth has to do with those people that are on the earth. But he's not just worried about the people that he's on the earth. He says, and from thy face shall I be hid. Now, I wonder what he thought it means to be hid, hid by the face of God. Certainly, it means to be, fa uh, to, to be hid from blessing. But uh, remember what we just said a little while ago about Adam and Eve told that the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die? Look back in Genesis chapter 3. And look at verse 8. And they heard the voice of God, of the Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam, uh, and Adam and his wife hid themselves, now notice that phrase, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. See, a separation took place between man and God where now sinful man cannot dwell in the presence of a holy God. And when that holy God showed up, man's very aware of his sinful condition, and he goes and he hides himself from God because to stand in the presence of a holy God in sin is going to be damnation. God is immediately going to make the first promise of the gospel. When he finally confronts him, verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, he's talking to Satan here, and between thy seed and her seed, the seed of the woman is eventually going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. It, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou, Satan, shall bruise his heel. And that Satan is going to bruise the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the picture that I've always heard painted on the cross is that anyone hanging on a cross, in order to breathe, they put a little peg at, on the cross so that a person could put his weight of his body on that heel and lift himself up to breathe. Otherwise, just going to lay there and suffocate. And on the cross, certainly Jesus Christ, the Bible says, he was bruised for our iniquity. 
And certainly his heel was bruised on that cross as he was dying there, and Satan thinking that he's defeating the seed of the woman. But the very thing that, that Satan thought he was bruising and destroying the seed of the woman in resurrection, the story has been turned around. We now lo know that the gospel is, is that Jesus Christ on that cross was dying to pay for our sins and to defeat sin and Satan. And that became the crushing blow to the serpent's head. You want to kill a snake? You know what you do? Step on its head. That's how you kill a snake. And Jesus Christ, his heel came down on the head of the serpent on that cross, and that cross became the means by which Satan's power over man has been destroyed. And salvation is through the cross of Christ. But, but here, until Jesus Christ made a promise of eternal life, man didn't have a hope before God. And Adam and Eve went and hid themselves from the presence of God. And for someone to die in sin, that's why the Bible says in Ezekiel 18, verse 4, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, means eternal separation from God. And God who created heaven and earth is going to restore the heaven into the earth under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's called the kingdom of God. And if your soul is separated from God forever, you're not in the new heaven and you're not in the new earth, there's only one other place for you to be. That is a lake of fire. So when, when Cain said something there, it, see what it is, is we think that these men didn't know as much about God and spiritual things as we do today, when the truth of the matter is, I mean, Adam and here, he's talking to God. They knew more about spiritual things than we do. And uh, when, Cain, when Cain said, from thy face, he understood that being separated from the face of God is going to be an eternal consequence that he faces. I believe so, and I believe the testimony of Scripture will b bear it out. Now, let's do this, just for the sake, because it's quite interesting, just to look at all the places where it talks about the presence of God and, uh, and what it means to be in the presence of God or, or not to be in the presence of God. Come to Leviticus chapter 22. Sometimes you look at something like that, you see it, okay, I see it. But if you look at verse after verse after verse, then you go, I see it, I see it, oh, that's it. <laughs> and look at these verses. We're going to look at several of them. Leviticus chapter 22. Uh, some of these, I, I we're, we're going to end up looking at some con uh, whole sections. In fact, we're going to read some chapters, because I think that we just need to do that. But here we'll just jump right into the verse. It says in Leviticus 22.3, Say unto them, Whosoever he be of your seed among your generations that goeth into the whole, uh, unto the holy things, which the children of Israel hallowed unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. Now to be cut off from God's presence, Leviticus 22 verse 3 I just read. I read the right place. <laughs> Anyhow, that you can see that it's a dangerous thing to be cut off from the presence of God. It's to be cut off from God, and God is, doesn't just exist in the presence. God is eternal, and to be cut off from God would be to eternally cut off from God. Come to Second Kings. And by the way, when you run these verses about presence, there's a lot of illustrations that are there, because as we go to the kings, you know, not anybody could walk in the presence of a king. That was a special privilege to be in the presence of the king. Or if the king would have you removed, that would be a, uh, that would be a dangerous thing. So, so it even works in type as you look up the presence and talk about being in the presence of, of a king. But here this has to do with God again in uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. In verse 23. It says, The Lord was gracious unto them, and had compassion on them, and had respect unto them, because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. And it's talking about Israel being cut off out of the land and cut out of the presence of God. And because of the promise he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's putting up with the nation of Israel <laughs> up to a certain point, and then they're going to be cut off from his presence. And when they're cut off from his presence, they're going to be cut off from God. And that's going to be a spiritual death that's going to take place uh, for anyone cut off from God. Now, look at Psalm 16. In 
if you have trouble finding Psalms, it usually don't. It's almost in the middle of your Bible, a little bit to the left. But anyhow, we're going to come back and look at, you know, most people turn to Psalms when they want comfort. I look to Psalms when I want to read about revenge. <laughs> well, I'll show you why when we come back to it. Uh, hopefully we come back to this. But, but for right now, just verses about the, God's presence. Psalm 1611, it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there's pleasures forevermore. Now see, that's what Cain is. To be cut off from the face of God means he's going to forfeit the paths of life. He's going to forfeit the fullness of joy. He's forfeited uh, uh, that there are pleasures forevermore. In fact, he's going to have all the opposite of that. No joy, no pleasure, suffering forevermore. Because all that is in the presence of God and he's cut off from the presence of God because he he refused to do what God said and, and stayed in his sin when God offered him another chance to be forgiven. Uh, come over to chapter 31. Psalms 31. Verse 20. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the, from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. And so it's talking about that if God keeps you there, that in his presence, that's keeping you in a place of safety. Uh, Psalms 51. In verse 11. This is a psalm where David had sinned against God, uh, committed murder himself. Wonder about the voice of Uriah crying out to God. And, uh, and yet God, through the prophet Nathan, told David he's not going to die. God's not going to take his life. He's not going to kill him spiritually e- even. And this is what David is understanding and, and realizing his own sinfulness and yet God is going to promise him salvation. David's crying out in Psalm 51, verse 11, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See, the Spirit is the Spirit of life. Not every person in the Old Testament had the Holy Spirit, but David did. And he didn't want to lose the Spirit of life, nor be cast out of God's presence. And, uh, and God is going to put away his sin, because Jesus Christ is going to come and die and pay for that sin, and fulfill the voice that's going to cry from the grave for vengeance, Jesus Christ will take the vengeance on himself. He'll pay for the sin so that a person like David who trusts in God for salvation could be saved. Uh, And look at Psalms 104. uh, No, 140. Verse 13, the last verse. Surely the righteous shall give thee thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell, where? In thy presence. So you really see that all the way through the scriptures is to be in God's presence, is to be to have your sins forgiven and to have eternal life and to be able to spend uh, eternity with God. Uh, there is, by the way, something else that I didn't dwell on, but there's almost as many verses on it. And since you're in Psalms, I'll show you a couple of these. Look back to Psalm 68, just so that you realize that it's not always good to be in the presence of God. It depends on how God looks at you when you're in his presence. Uh, because all the time when it talks about God judging the world, uh, it uses a phrase like in, in Psalm 68, verse 8. It says, uh, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. And when it's moved, he's coming back in judgment. Look at one more. Look at Psalms 97. In verse 5, it says, The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord uh, of the whole earth. 
the heavens declare his righteousness and all his people see his glory. Uh, and so he's coming back in judgment. And when he comes back in judging, there's going to be some melting and some fire that's going to take place because some people in his presence are going to be judged while others in his presence are going to enter into everlasting joy. And, uh, and so it depends if he, if he comes back as your savior or he comes back as your judge. And that really depends on you. God gave Cain an opportunity. He said, if you do well, won't you be accepted? And Cain, instead of doing that, Cain went and killed his brother. Just eliminate, we'll just eliminate God's way totally. He'll kill his brother. And, uh, he's not going to succeed. God's going to have his way and, and Cain is going to be hid from his presence. Now, I want to show you something else before we stop looking at those verses on, on the presence of God because that continues in the New Testament. Come with, come with me to Acts chapter 3. By the way, in Luke chapter 1 verse 19, Gabriel shows up and he says, I'm Gabriel that stands in the presence of God. That, that's a holy angel. Uh, so just the way that he identifies himself as someone who's, who's related to God and speaks for God. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is calling on the nation of Israel, even though they killed Christ, that God knew that that was going to take place. It actually is the means by which God can save the nation of Israel. And so Peter calls on the nation of Israel to repent in verse 19 of Acts 3, saying, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. From what? the presence of the Lord. See, Jesus Christ is going to come back and restore this earth and restore the kingdom to the nation of Israel and they can be a part of that restoration and have their sins forgiven if they'll just, for the nation of Israel, repent, change their mind about who they think the Messiah was, believe in Jesus Christ, and they're called on to be water baptized because that's how Israel is called to identification with Jesus Christ. Uh, we're just called on to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that is we who are Gentiles. But speaking of us Gentiles, come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul talks about... Uh, us, and it says, uh, verse 19, For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? 1 Thessalonians 2.19 For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Paul looks forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows, Chapter 4, he's going to come for us in the air, and we're going to be caught up to be with the Lord. And Paul says, you know what our rejoicing is? You, the people he's ministered to, in the presence of the Lord. Why? That's salvation, isn't it? And to be cut off from the presence of the Lord is to be damned. And to be cut off from the presence of the Lord forever is to be damned to a lake of fire forever and ever. Uh, look at Second Thessalonians. Here's the damned. Talking about Jesus Christ coming back in judgment. In verse 8 it says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like that phrase. Obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does God want you to do in obedience to the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you obey the gospel, you'll not trust your works, you'll trust his work. You'll believe that he paid for your sins, that he can give you eternal life as a free gift, and you'll trust the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation. If you, the way you disobey the gospel is you'll say, no, I'm going to get there my way. I'm going to do it through my penance, through my works, through my works of righteousness. Uh, he can do his part, and I'm going to do my part. Or you just say, no, I don't need to be saved, and you don't do nothing. Well, that's if, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved, is, is the invitation to the gospel. To disobey that is to refuse to do it. 
So it says he's going to come back in flaming fire on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So if the New Testament talks about this lake of fire and a soul being cut off and suffering eternal destruction uh, from the presence of God, then why would we think any different back there when Cain said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. You've driven me off from the face of the earth and from thy face have I been driven. And certainly Cain, in realizing that he's been not only cut off from man, but cut off from God, is an eternal consequence that's more than some people understand because all you got, what does it mean to be cut off from the presence of God? Well, we just search the scriptures and we have a testimony of scripture, what it means. And now when you understand what this means, you look at that Second Thessalonians 2, uh, 1, verse 9, then you would understand exactly what Cain means when he says, the punishment is greater than I can bear. He might have lived the rest of his life in a city, building it and naming it after his son and, and trying to live rather than a vagabond and a fugitive, trying to live safe and in one place. He might have tried to do that. But there's, when you talk about hell, it's called like wandering stars in the darkness. Uh, that's how it's described in the book of Jude. And, uh, and so his punishment is something yet to come at the hand of God. Now, that, that leads me to say something else that's real basic concerning Old Testament scripture. First, go to Acts chapter 17. There's something real basic that is found in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 1. Someone quote me that verse. Okay. In the beginning, heaven and the earth, singular. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, But my point is to you is, in the beginning, who? God. Now, you have to stop at some point in, in your Bible study and say, exactly when we say God, what do we mean? Well, the Bible does say that there's in the world there are God's many and Lord's many. But Paul also says to us who believe there's but one God. <laughs> and and what does it mean when we talk about God? What what are we talking about? Who is God? Now, eventually God gives us his name in the Old Testament it's Jehovah, in the New Testament it's Jesus and uh and relates to us in 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 the person of Christ. But just the, fr- the phrase God. Well, Paul, when he was dealing with those who don't know God in, in Acts 17, says in verse 24, he's going to tell them who God is. Look at the first thing he says to them. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now there's an identification. And when you talk about God, just to know that God exists, you're meaning your creator and your Lord. Now, a creator, he creates you for a purpose. You live in rebellion against your creator, he's also your Lord. Because Paul goes on to talk about how uh, he doesn't, isn't worshipped by men's hands as though God needs something from man. <laughs> and isn't that, the, isn't that just what God, man does? Rather, rather the, what man does is he creates a God and worships the God he creates. When the truth of the matter is, God created us, and we need to know who He is and worship Him like He is. And He's not an image. He's not a statue. He needs nothing from us. He don't need us to build Him a house or to carry Him around as a little statue and put Him on our dashboard because He can't walk. Uh, God is God. He's a living God who made us. And then when He told the nation of Israel, His people don't make any graven image of me because man don't imagine God. God in his creation created man. Then the other thing is that Paul says about this this God. He says, uh, uh, verse 30, speaking about the Gentiles worshiping the images, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he hath ordained, and whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. The man Christ Jesus, that God is going to judge the world through the Lord Jesus Christ, that man has rejected. He's God who became a man, and man crucified the God-man that came to him. 
And God raised him from the dead and someday is going to judge this world. So the thing that when you talk about God, who is God? Well, he is the creator. He is Lord of heaven and earth. And he has appointed a day in which he's going to judge the creation that he made. If you would want just a simple definition of God from Old Testament to New Testament, creator and judge. So if that is a true definition of God, and I challenge you, you read the Bible everywhere about God. You know when it says that Noah got into the ark? It says, God commanded him to enter in the ark, and the Lord shut the door. The Lord is, speaks about the salvation through Jesus Christ, but God commanded because God is about to judge, and if Noah didn't get in there, he was going to be judged with the world. God is creator and judge. If Old Testament saints knew anything about God, you know what they knew? They faced their creator and their judge. And that judge isn't just within your short little lifespan that you had to worry about him finding you. It, it, it's an eternal thing that you're dealing with because you're dealing with eternal God. Now, from what I was going to show you at this point, and, and the way I was going to show it to you, uh, I guess we'll just start on it next week because we can't hardly do it right now. But I just want to, I, I, I'm looking at these verses that would kind of just, just prove what I just said to you. They're enormous. There's so many of them. And most of them you can find in the book of Psalms. And what we're going to do is we're going to read all of Psalms chapter 7. All of, is it 7? <laughs> Which ones they marked down? Oh, we're going to start at chapter 9 and chapter 10 and chapter 11. We're going to read the whole, all three of those Psalms and see what God says about judgment and what, what man knew about God when he thinks about God and thinks about him who has pointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness. And, uh, and you'll see very clearly Old, Saint, Old Testament saints knew an awful lot about God and the judgment that man faces. But we're out of time right now. I thought we'd have five minutes left, but we'll have to stop right there. Got a question before we close class? Did Paul write the Old Testament too? For them people say we only, you know, study the New Testament. Did he write? Okay, I didn't catch it. Kurt? Yeah. Yeah, we don't know how old. It says in the process of time that God told them to bring a sacrifice. And so they, they were at an age of an accountability. And we know that when King left and started the city, that the first thing he did, he did, he, he knew his wife and had a son. So apparently he was probably already married when he brought the sacrifice. And uh, if Adam and, Le Adam and Eve lived 930 years, uh, one of the things that I, uh, when I chart out the time of the early days, if you think about it, like sometimes those guys in the Bible that, that lived that long, they don't get married till after they're 100 and something years old. Can you imagine if your parents are having kids for the first 700 years? Because after that, 200, when you're 800 years old, maybe you're too old to have kids anymore. I don't know. <laughs> but, but by the time you grew up, moved out, and did your thing, and you could have a sister that you never even knew. And it's not like you know, you're growing up in a home and you're, you know, incest or anything like that. There's the, the whole, everything is pure at this point. And, uh, and the relationship there is not like what you think about it in our day. Well, if we say soul, we know that the soul eventually from the New Testament will learn that it went to Hades where all souls go when they die. But Hades has two parts to it. And that's where when we get to the New Testament and the teaching of Christ, he clarifies those things that... Uh, were a little bit vague. They were talked about in the Old Testament, but the Lord just clearly illustrates there's a place of departed spirit, one in a place that's called Abraham's bosom, a place of rest, and another place, a place of suffering. So depending on if you're going to be in the presence of God, you went to a place of rest. And if, you went, if you're going to be eternally separated from God, you went to a place of torment immediately. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, and when you think about that mark upon Cain, don't ever think about the mark of the beast. By the way, do you know the last time the Bible refers to someone being separated from the presence of God? 
Revelation 14.10 when it's talking about those who took the mark of the beast. You look at Cain and look at them and go, ooh, ooh. <laughs> man, I don't want that. Uh, Kurt. Well, that's, yeah, that's why I said I would say soul. There's a sense in which the spirit is a spirit of life that God takes back. The soul is you, the person that, that was created, and, uh, and that the soul is what the Bible talks about being lost. Uh, I'm not, I'm not so sure that the, the spirit not just being the intellect of man, but the, the life that God imparted is taken back by God. And the person in hell doesn't have life, he has death, but that's existence apart from God. So. Yes. He's going to get a new body to go there. He don't have a body that's capable of living in hell until God raises him and gives him one. Okay. Good question. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the class today. And, and, uh, it, hell's not something that we choose to dwell on. Although, Father, if evil touches our life and wickedness that's in the world, and it certainly will affect us to some degree. And some people suffer horrendous tortures and, and violent deaths at the hand of evil men. That, Father, that, uh, that it is good to know that no one ever gets away with it, that you're a God of justice and you do see all things, and that we ourselves don't have to worry about taking on the vengeance. You will deal out a just punishment based on what is right, and we can trust you to always do right. But Father, at the same time, we realize how short we all come and how deserving we all deserve to be cut off from your presence. We've all rebelled against you. And we thank you for the salvation that's offered through Jesus Christ so that through him we might be saved and dwell in that fullness of joy with you forevermore. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.